Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeads here with a soil labs walkthrough. So this is the first topic in the CED 4.2 and 4.3, where the suggested science skill is to actually identify a testable hypothesis or to you know, describe the methods used in a study. So this is a really important opportunity to try to do a lab. I know many of you are past this point in the curriculum already, but this might be a helpful video for you to circle back and check out later. Uh, or if you haven't made it to topic four yet or unit four, it's be a great chance to try to introduce a lab. So what we're going to go over in this video is the skill of writing a hypothesis. And we're going to try to make it an inquiry based hypothesis. And then we're also going to go over four really important characteristics of soil quality. So we'll go through how you actually perform the test. You can see here I've got a little different setup than normal. We have some soil testing materials in front here. I like to use the Carolina uh, soil productivity kit. I just kind of take out some of the tests and use them for measuring properties. I don't do the whole lab. I've never had time. But at any rate, I'll walk you through here basically how you're going to do this lab and how you're going to do these really important four measures of soil quality. So before we jump right into it, uh, we'll talk about those measures really briefly. We're going to look through soil texture. So how do we characterize soils based on the percentage of sand, silt, and clay that make them up? We're going to look at permeability and water holding capacity. This is a really easy test, maybe one of the most important for students to understand. So we'll look at how easily water moves through a soil and also how much water is retained by that soil. We'll look at nutrients and pH, also a really critical test. What are our nitrogen levels? What are our phosphorus levels? And how does pH uh, play a role in determining how many nutrients or the levels of nutrients that are found in soil? And then finally, we'll talk about cation exchange capacity. This is a pretty nuanced test. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but if you have the Carolina kit, you already have the solution you need to do cation exchange capacity. So I wanted to bring that up. All right. So we'll start out with soil texture because soil texture is one of the most basic ways to classify a soil. And that's just going to be the percentage of sand, silt, and clay that you have in a given soil sample. So the test is pretty straightforward. You just scoop uh, some predetermined amount of soil into your jar. I think the Carolina kit's going to tell you to do three quarters of an ounce, but you can change that accordingly. You just want to keep it consistent throughout your samples. And what we have here is a sample from the garden out back in our school here that was set out for 24 hours overnight. And then one important thing to add is you also want to drop just one little drop of dish soap into your sample. It's just going to help give some clarity to your different layers. So then what we can do is hold up a, a ruler here next to our sample. And what you want to do is get down really low on the eye level uh, of the table so that you can really see the different layers and that you can measure them out. And what you're going to have is your sand on the bottom and then your silt and your clay. And so I measured this layer here. Uh, we ended up with a total depth of the sand, silt and clay at about 1.6 centimeters. And so you can just see that based on the depth of the sand, the silt and the clay, we ended up at about 56% sand, 31% silt and about 13% clay. Uh, this is kind of interesting. This fits somewhat with the sandy loam soils that I know are characteristic of West Michigan. And so it looks like our garden uh, is no exception. And so what we can do then is kind of find where this would fall on our soil texture triangle or soil texture chart. And so I like to start with the percent sand. And so we'd go down between 50 and 60 because we're at 56%. And then I'm going to go with the percent silt. So I'm going to take this out to where it meets the 30% silt, which would be right here because we're at about 31. And then a nice way to check is to just look over at the uh, clay and see if we're near 13%. And if we look over here, we are between 10 and 20. So we would be right here in the sandy loam sort of category, close to a loam though. And so this will tell us again, the percentage of sand, silt and clay. And it's important uh, first step in kind of classifying what soil you have and then helping to understand the permeability and the water holding capacity of your soil. Next, we'll talk about how to measure permeability and water holding capacity. So I like to use this graphic here to help students kind of grasp the idea of how pore size or you know, the empty air that's able to fill a soil is related to its permeability. So we can do a really simple test for permeability. We can put different soil types into these little plastic columns. And then you have a cheesecloth or some sort of permeable membrane at the bottom and that will hold your soil in place. And then you get 10 milliliters of water and you're going to just pour that water through each of your samples. Now it's really important that you have a student timing this for you or that you time it. And then what you can measure is the amount of time it takes for that first drop of water to make it through the column, or you can time the amount of, the amount of time it takes for all of the water to make it through essentially for the column to stop dripping. And so that would be permeability. And of course, the faster water is moving through, the higher the permeability and vice versa. 
Another thing that you can do though is using the same setup, you can test the water holding capacity. And so you would essentially saturate your soil sample. So you'd fill it with some predetermined amount of water. Uh, and if you're wondering about how to do this in more detail, in the description below, there will be a link to Google Doc that has exact directions for each of these tests. And so again, you would saturate your soil essentially, and then typically let it sit for a predetermined amount of time. Again, you could let it sit overnight and you would wanna have the mass of your column beforehand. So we could just take the dry mass of our sand and, and our humus and our clay you know, beforehand. And then after saturating it and let it sit for a predetermined amount of time, you would take the mass after the fact. And then of course the difference there is gonna help you understand how much of that water volume was retained by the column. So this is great and enables students again to have a visual that goes with this. This really helps them grasp why sandy soils are so permeable, why water passes through so quickly versus clay dominated soils uh, trapping water and, and holding it much more effectively uh, and sometimes too effectively compared to a sandy soil. And then what I also love here is the fact that the humus adds another element where we can look at how dense is organic matter compared to soil particles. Gives us a great chance to talk about what humus actually is, how large the particles are, where they come from. And so just a really great demonstration to help students understand permeability and then also to think about water holding capacity. Now we'll talk about another really important soil quality test, which is nutrient levels and pH levels. So this is so critical for plant growth. And so it's really critical that students understand what does pH measure and why does that matter for nutrient levels? So we can look at this chart here, which is really helpful for helping students grasp that. So you can see we have the pH levels of different soils on the x-axis down here. And then what we have is a bunch of different important soil nutrients. So these have, are gonna be things that are critical for plant growth, starting of course with nitrogen and phosphorus at the top. And then you can see these green colors are gonna to correspond to the pH where these nutrients are most available in the soil. So where they're able to be held by the soil, where the plants can have access to them. And so you can see pretty quickly, you know, that this seven to six range is gonna be pretty important for soil's nutrient holding ability. And so then what we can do is actually measure the pH and the nutrient level, specifically phosphorus and nitrogen of our soils. So those tests are done a little bit differently, but I'll quickly walk you through each. So we have the pH test here. And again, this is just a little chamber, a simple kit test that comes from Carolina. And so what you do is fill up with actual soil to the bottom dotted line. Then you crack open this little pill capsule uh, into the chamber, and then you fill the rest of the way up with water, shake it up for a while, let it sit, and then you can compare the color of your solution to the pH color chart there. And the nitrogen and phosphorus tests here are very similar, but they're just a little bit different. What you wanna do is have this soil sample that sat overnight uh, for 24 hours. So this is a great test to do in combination with your, with your texture test. And so you have this set out overnight, and then you come back and you're gonna pipette off the water from the middle here, trying to avoid the sediment as much as possible. And you fill each of these test chambers up with just the water. And then the same idea is you're just gonna open that pill up and it's going to add the kind of reagent in there, shake it up and then compare your colors to the color chart. So again, uh, really helpful here for an inquiry lab because you can have students test either the soil of different locations, you know, maybe one where there's more organic matter or one where they think there's a faster rate of decomposition for some reason. You can even have them test soil from like a potted plant at home or soil from you know, bagged soil at a garden store. So you have a lot of possibilities here for doing inquiry-based lab with respect to both pH and nutrient levels. And then finally, we'll talk about cation exchange capacity. Now I wanna point out, this is a pretty nuanced soil characteristic. It's not explicitly in the CED, but if you have the Carolina kit, you have the materials required to do this. And it's a really powerful way, I think, to help students grasp why different soil charges actually matter for nutrient retention. So I like to start out with this diagram here. Uh, this is a great diagram that helps us understand that clay is gonna be one of the most negatively charged particles we may find in our soil. And so the importance of this is the fact that many uh, nutrients that soil needs, many uh, positively charged macronutrients important for plant growth will bind to this clay particle. So we have calcium, we have magnesium, potassium, and what this enables the plant to do is actually to secrete H plus ions. So plants will pump H plus ions out of their roots and they basically swap with the clay particle for nutrients. And so clay is a really vital aspect of soil 
because it's needed to help retain those nutrients, which enables plants to then gain access to them when they need them. And so you can also then, especially with your students that have a firmer grasp on chemistry, that may understand a little bit better what pH actually measures, you can explain that a soil with a really low pH is gonna have a really high concentration of H plus ions surrounding these clay particles and these other negatively charged particles. So those H plus ions, I like to explain to students, basically bind to this clay and bump off or displace these positively charged nutrients, which can then leach out of the soil. And so this is a great diagram, I think, for helping students understand why does soil pH matter? Again, you have to make that link though between a low pH and a high H plus ion concentration. It's not really explicitly stated in the APE's uh, CED, but it's something that if you bring that in from a chemistry standpoint is really helpful for students that can grasp that. Uh, so the way that we can model this with the soil test is through a dye called crystal violet. So this is gonna be a dye that has a positive charge. And what you'll do is drop uh, 20 droplets of crystal violet into each of your different soil samples. So the ones that I have here are a topsoil sample uh, from a garden near our school, uh, a sand sample, and then a mixture of clay and sand. So after you've dropped 20 droplets of the crystal violet, uh, you're going to then use a pipette to add one milliliter increments of water to that solution. And you're basically going to watch at the bottom and see what is the color of the solution that's eluded out of your column look like. Then you can use that again to discuss these nutrients and why clay and other negatively charged soil particles are so critical for helping retain nutrient levels. And one other interesting thing I always find doing this lab is that even though crystal violet is just a positively charged you know, ion that we're using to simulate these positively charged nutrients that soil needs to be able to hold, it's a really powerful visual for helping students understand the way that soils can filter water. So there's something about seeing this really dark, rich purple color kind of permeate through the soil, but then stop and seeing perfectly clear water eluded out of the bottom Again, it's just a powerful visual. It can help students really actually grasp how, you know, wetlands and how intact productive soils can grab onto pollutants that are going to be flowing through them and then recharge our groundwater sources with clean water. Just kind of an added bonus to doing this lab. So now that we've gone through the actual procedures or how to do the tests, remember there's a link in the description below that will walk you through exactly how these tests should be done in more student facing direction terms. But what I've included here is the slides that I use to do a really simple inquiry based lab. And so what I have students do is get into groups and do this in person, you can do this over Zoom, and the students are going to identify two locations that they want to collect soil samples from to test. Again, they could also choose, you know, potted soil or bagged soil from a garden store or compare that to a natural source of soil nearby. So they pick their two locations and then after showing them this video or after helping them understand how these different soil tests are done, I ask them to pick two characteristics or qualities of soil that they're going to measure. And I try to make it really straightforward for students, especially this is a little bit earlier in the year. This is before we've done a lot of labs where they're selecting variables. So I like to make it really straightforward and just have them highlight the two soil variables or soil quality measures that they're going to test. If you want to simplify this, you can take out cation exchange capacity. It's one of the more challenging and one of the more nuanced points. So if you want to simplify it, I would recommend doing that. Um, and then I give them kind of this claim template. So I ask students to make a claim, you know, the soil from location blank will have a higher or lower. And then I have this graphic here to help them remember that you're going to actually insert your dependent variable there. So whatever your soil uh, quality measure is, you actually want to put it right into your template there. So we might say, the soil from my backyard will have a lower pH than the soil from, I don't know, you know, near the beach. Maybe it's sandier. Uh, and you might want to point out to students too that we wouldn't just say we have a higher or lower uh, soil texture. So if you were using texture, you might say, I think this soil will be a higher percentage of sand or a lower percentage of sand. Um, so there's a little nuance there, but I think that this template is really helpful for students making claims that will be in the terms that they need to on the AP exam. And then finally, I do ask them to explain their reasoning a little bit. I want them to think about, is there more organic matter in a certain area? Do they think that human activity has contributed? Is there runoff from nearby farms, from a golf course? Uh, and so just get students thinking about why they might have made a prediction that there'd be a higher porosity or water holding capacity in a certain area. And then finally, we just have a simple slide here to go through the data analysis. I like to keep it short and concise. We're not doing a full lab write-up. 
uh, especially this year, we just don't have the time. And so the idea is that they do this in class actually after, after they have collected their data. And so it's pretty straightforward. You know, do the data that you collected support your claim, explain why or why not. And then based on your results, I want them to think a little bit about fertility. So what does the water holding capacity of your two soils mean about plant growth in those areas? Or what does the pH of those soils predict about what plants may be able to su be supported in that area? And then finally, this is an important skill to do on the exam is to look at your procedure and then identify a different method that could be used, but within a similar procedure. So I like students at the end to pick a different soil quality measure and then predict if they were to measure that uh, soil quality you know, aspect in a different experiment using the same locations though, how might those results come out? I hope this video was helpful in showing you how to do your own soil in Cree Lab if you have the time and the materials. Remember, these are all materials from a Carolina Soil Productivity Kit. And if you don't have the time or the materials to do a soil productivity or a soil inquiry lab, I hope that this video could serve as kind of a stand-in. This is the first topic in the CED where the paired suggested science skill is designing an investigation and identifying procedures for an investigation. So this is a really critical lab that I think should either be done or should at least be reviewed so that you understand, again, how would you measure soil quality using all of these different parameters? And what do these parameters mean about the environmental conditions in an area and the ability of that soil to support plant growth? Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below about how to do this experiment. Again, remember all of the materials that were mentioned in this lab, so the student facing directions, uh, the slides for the inquiry based lab, those are both gonna be in the description below. Hope you guys have a great day and keep thinking like mountains and writing like scholars.